in a world that seems to have lost focus. Join Pastor Chris Truitt on Focal Point, a ministry of Bethel Free Will Baptist Church of Kinston. Find your Focal Point in Christ starting now. Hi, isn't it? Welcome to Bethel Free Will Baptist Church. Thank you for being here today. If you're a guest, we would love to have an account of your visit here. So like right in front of you is like a guest registration card, or you can just take out your bulletin and take your phone over the QR code there, and it'll bring you to a place to sign up just to report you being here today with us. Our pastor will send you some information, and then we will continue to pray for you. But thank you for choosing to worship here. Worship the Lord with us together here at the Bethel Church. Life groups, those classes began regathering today. So if you need some help with that, like I'm going to come back to, we used to call it Sunday school, now it's life groups, but I want to come back to that. Where can I go? Where's my age group? Who's the teachers? Those can be found at the Connection Center. It tells you like all of them that's going on, where they're meeting at, and the times that they're meeting, because some of them were at 915 and some of them are now at this time. So life groups, praise the Lord, is back today. So thank the Lord for that. Easter, make sure you mark this down. Easter's coming coming up, invite somebody to come with you, buy your bonnets so you can wear them to church. Just kidding, right? But people still wear bonnets to church, right, on Easter? That's just a cool tradition, but uh, I don't think I'll get one for Kathy. I don't think she would wear it. But anyway, on Easter, make sure that you're making plans to be with us. 8.30, 9.45, or 11 o'clock. All these services are available. There's no life groups, no Sunday school that morning. These are just all family in worship for Easter. You choose one of those times to come to 8 30, 9 45, and 11. Men's cookout breaking news. Breaking news on the men's cookout right now. It's an upgrade. You want to hear the upgrade, the good news about this? All men's invited, and we've went from barbecue chicken to Steaks. Come on now, let's have it, right? A good steak over barbecue chicken any day. So steaks are going to be offered. Make sure you sign up so we'll know how many steaks to cook, right? So I need for you to do that today. That's on the 20th. We hope all men join us. Baptism, if you've been saved, you've truly been saved, but you've never followed the Lord in believer's baptism, Man, look into the scriptures, talk to pastor, talk to somebody, look in the scriptures, pray about what does God want me to do about baptism. I think it's pretty clear in the scripture. Everybody in the New Testament that was saved, follow the Lord in believer's baptism. Everybody, except one, and he died on the cross next to Jesus. He couldn't get down to get baptized. So if you've been saved, you've never been baptized, you need to be praying, ask the Lord what you need to do about that. And I think he'll guide you into baptism. We have two of them planned, the 21st and the 28th. Hopefully one of those will work out for you. Wednesday night services for adults. Now this is just adults. There's a service in here at 5 p.m. This Wednesday, 5 p.m., adults right in here. And then at 7 p.m., adults in the dining hall. Hopefully we'll see you in one of those. These discipleship groups going good. These are starting to get some momentum going back. You know, the women meeting on Tuesday morning. The men have three dates right now. We hope that you choose one of those, pick one of those, and make that happen. Next step began today. We were so thankful to have five members, five potential members, five individuals in the class today, thinking, praying as if this is a place that they want to become their home church. If you are not a member, we'd invite you into membership. Come to the next step class. We'll see you next Sunday. Our offering boxes, we forgot to say this last week. Offering boxes, we quit taking the offering because of COVID and cooties and all that kind of stuff. And so what you want to do now with the offering on the walls in the back, here, here, and right there are our offering boxes. So when you leave, when you come in, just put your offering right in there and we will collect those after service. But it is a great place for us to be today. In the house of the Lord, we're here to worship God. And so thank you for being here. Will you stand with us right now as we tell about a great thing? Good morning and welcome to Bethel Church for worship this morning. Here's what I can tell you. It's a great day to worship the Lord. And our God continues to do great and wonderful things for us, does he not? Worthy of our worship, 
Sing it with me here. Let's all sing it. Come, let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. For the 
for that. Amen. I like that question that it poses that who can stop the Lord Almighty? We know the answer, right? Absolutely nothing. Because he is God and complete control of everything. Amen. He is sovereign. Because the earth and everything in it, the world and its inhabitants belong to the Lord. For he laid its foundation on the seas and established its rivers. And look at verse 8 right here. Here's another question for you. Who is this king of glory? Here's who he is, church. He is the Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. So lift up your heads, you gates. Rise up, ancient doors. And the king of glory will come in. Who is he? This king of glory, he's the Lord of hosts, and he is the king of glory. Amen. Let's sing about him and his holiness today. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Merciful and mighty 
singing.
worship. Get it ready to start back again, Chad, because I'm going to need a minute to, to get myself together, okay? I'm so glad to see so many of you. Because we're back. But God's not back because he never left. <clears throat> so take us to that mountains part again. And let's praise the Lord corporately together this morning. Let's sing it. The mountains will shake. <clears throat> the mountains shake before you. The demons run and flee. At the mention of your name, King of Majesty, there is no power in hell. pray with me. Father, Lord, we come in this place, Lord. I can just feel your presence here today. Lord, thank you for being here. Lord, you promised where two or three are gathered, you're there with us. And Lord, we're just thrilled to be gathered together to worship. So Lord, I pray that your presence would continue right now. Lord, that your Holy Spirit would walk these aisles right now. And the Lord, we would sense your presence. Lord, I've sensed you here during our time of worship. Oh God, I want to sense you during the time of the word. So Lord, I pray not only for this service right here, Lord, I pray for every place around the world where the gospel is preached today. Lord, may men and women boys and girls be saved. Lord, may homes be put back together. Lord, may lives be restored. May addictions be conquered. May people be forgiven because they're coming to you. Lord, meet with us right here. Now, God, may your eyes be open and your ears be attentive to the prayers of your people in this place. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Before you're seated, would you say this with me aloud and make it your prayer today as we look at God's word. Say it with me. Open my eyes so that I may contemplate wonderful things from your instruction. You may be seated. Be turning your Bibles today to Zechariah chapter three. So glad to have so many back today who've been away because of this horrible pandemic. So it's good to have you back. So thankful that the COVID numbers in our area are dropping and just so glad to have you. If you're visiting with us, if I did not have a chance to meet you face to face, I'll be at the back at the conclusion of the service. Our staff will be back there. Um, and so uh, we are just glad that you are here today and uh, we would love to meet you. Zechariah chapter Three today, we're in the middle of a series entitled Fast Forward. 
Let me just tell you this. Right now, life groups are going on. Um, their life groups went on in their first hour. Probably many of you were in those life groups. A statistics that, that's hot off the press, okay? Tom Rayner, who runs a ministry entitled uh, Church Answers, they did a survey and, uh, and built some statistics. People who are in church for five years who are a part of a group, who are part of a group, a small group, a life group, a D group, some smaller group than just the sanctuary group like we're sitting right here. People who are a member of a group, 86% of those people five years later are still in church. Hey, be a part of a group. If we can help you find that group, we would love to. Talk to any of our staff. They'll be out here. You saw Doug at the beginning. You saw Chad on stage. Pastor Bert will be back there afterwards. Brick is right here. Brick and Allison, our youth pastor. Hey, we can love to talk to you about being in a group. Okay, let's get started this morning. Let me give you another stat right here. 85% of the things that you worry about. I just got your attention right then because we all worry. But 85% of the things that we worry about, you know, never even happen. Never come to fruition. 85%. Now, let me give you another statistic. 30% of an average person's anxiety is focused on things that already happened to them in the past and they can't do anything about it. So, 30% of the things you worry about are things in the past, you can't redo them anyhow. If we were honest with ourselves, we would all say there's something in our past that we regret doing and we wish we could do a do-over and have a second chance. All of us would say that. Let me tell you what I heard this week a pastor say as I was listening to a, a, a podcast. He said this, when we want a do-over, when we're thinking about our failures, when we're thinking about we, where we've messed up, here's what we need to focus on. We need to focus on our lessons instead of our losses. That pastor said, you know, I could say, I, want to, I wish I could go back and do over. But he said, I've come to the conclusion I don't want to go, go do over because I've learned more from the lessons than I would have learned if I'd have got it right the first time. And maybe then it will help me get it right the next time. So focus on your lessons, not the losses. Many people just cannot get over their past mistakes and failures. Let me ask you this. Do you deal with guilt on a daily basis? Do you deal with the guilt of your past on a daily basis? So let me encourage you this morning as we look at this passage in Zechariah 3. If you're dealing with your guilt from the past, move forward. How? Fast. Fast. So let's look this morning and we're going to be looking at Zechariah chapter 3, a message I've entitled, A Burning Stick Snatched from the Fire. Now, some of you are thinking, Preacher, where in the world did you get that title? <laughs> well, I'm going to show you. Right in God's Word, in just a few moments, a burning stick snatched from the fire. I remind you in this series, Fast Forward, I, I, I kind of got the idea uh, in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 16, it says, making the most of time because the days are evil. We must make the most of our time because days are getting short and we must go forward fast. Let me tell you, we are beginning to move forward. As a church, we're beginning to move forward. Let me tell you this, I'm glad to tell you in the last three weeks, our attendance has almost doubled. So we're moving forward we're increasing participation in D groups. We're regathered in life groups today. The next two consecutive weeks, we're going to be having baptism. And that's the people we already know who are signed up to be baptized. Students are returning to worship and activities. Wednesday night, our teen ministry, we're almost back up to numbers pre-COVID. 
just a little short, but almost back to pre-COVID numbers. We are coming back and regathering and we're moving forward. God is doing something. God is doing something. When we look at the book of Zechariah, when you think about the book of Zechariah, Zechariah's focus was threefold. Refocusing God's people, reestablishing God's kingdom, and then rebuilding the temple. Really in that order. Because Zechariah realized that rebuilding the temple was secondary. He knew that if God could rebuild their lives, then the people would rebuild the temple. Let me tell you what, church, if we can get people to get back to God, he'll take up filling, he'll take care of filling up the church. And God has just smitten me with saying this, Chris, quit trying to grow the church and instead just have impact in people's lives and be light and salt. And you know what? That's what I decided I'm going to do. And I'm going to let God worry about filling the church up. God began then in chapter one, giving Zechariah eight different visions. Today, we're in vision number four. Vision number one was the man in the myrtle trees. You remember that title? Then vision number two and three, the work of a skilled craftsman. When we saw how God re rescued his people and then God, how restored his people in vision three. And then today, a burning stick snatched from the fire. I bet you can't say that three times real quick. <laughs> Now, let's look in Zechariah chapter 3. I know that you stood for a while this morning, but let's stand in honor of God's word as we read. Zechariah 3 and verse 1. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing above the angel of the Lord, with Satan standing at his right side to accuse him. The Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. May the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Isn't this man a burning stick snatched from the fire? I told you I'd show you where I got that from. Verse 3. Now Joshua was dressed with filthy clothes as he stood before the angel. So he spoke to those standing before him, take off this, his filthy clothes. Then he said to him, see, I have removed your guilt from you, and I will clothe you with splendid robes. Then I said, let them put a clean turban on his head. So a clean turban was placed on his head and they clothed him in garments while the angel of the Lord was standing nearby. Then the angel of the Lord charged Joshua. This is what the Lord of hosts says. If you walk in my ways and keep my instructions, you will both rule my house and take care of my courts. I will also grant you access among these who are standing here. Listen, Joshua the high priest. You and your colleagues sitting before you. Indeed, these men are a sign that I am about to bring my servant the branch. Notice the stone I have set before you, Joshua. On that one stone are seven eyes. I will engrave an inscription on it, the declaration of the Lord of hosts. And I will take away the guilt of this land in a single day. On that day, each of you will invite his neighbor to sit under his vine and fig tree. This is the declaration of the Lord of hosts. Father, may you bless the reading of your word today. May the word of God not go out void. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated. Point number one this morning, I'm gonna jump right in on it, is God rebukes sin. We see that in those first two verses. God rebukes Satan, not just the sin, but then he rebukes Satan himself, Joshua. You know that name. He was the aide to Moses throughout the Old Testament. He, in this vision, represents the nation of Israel. And as that representative of Israel, not him personally, but Israel had sinned against God. The scene is now of Satan pointing his finger and accusing Israel. Zechariah is describing a courtroom that we will discuss at the very end. But in this courtroom, you have the righteous judge. That's God. You have the accused in this situation is Joshua representing Israel. Israel. Then you have Jesus is the defense attorney. And then you have Satan who is the prosecuting attorney. You know what? One day when I stand before God Almighty, it's going to be the same way. 
well, let's talk about this. And, and this vision that God is giving Zechariah, Satan, listen to this, Satan was insisting that Israel be punished. He, Satan's insisting the audacity. But then again, it's Satan. But he's insisting, insisting that Israel be punished. Reminder to you, Satan is always on the attack. 1 Peter 5 and verse 8. Be serious. Be alert. Your adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion looking for anyone he can devour. Satan is always on the attack. Yesterday, I was, I was out in the driveway and I was washing um, the truck. And, and I was watching along there and I got through and then I was, I'm, I'm vacuuming. Well, I'm, I'm wearing a pair of Crocs with no socks on, okay? And so then I felt some little stings and I looked down and there's a row of fire ants that I'm standing in the middle of. So I stomp them off, I go to the water hose, wash my feet off, then I take my, my blower and I blow the ants off. Put the blower up, go back to vacuuming. I'm vacuuming at the, at the car and then I feel some little stings again. I look down, and they're right back. Well, a smart guy would have moved the truck. But they came right back. They came back. I blew them off again. You know what? I bet if, when I go home, if I look in that same spot again, they're going to be back again. You know what? Because they're relentless. They're not going to stop. And listen to me. Listen to me. Satan's not going to stop attacking you. He's going to keep coming back and back and back and back. And listen, if you keep doing the same thing over and over and over, you just keep blowing them away. They're going to, he's going to keep coming back. Move the truck. Move the truck in your life. Don't just keep blowing Satan off. It's not going to get any better because he keeps prowling. But you know what? Jesus is my defense. First John 2. My little children, I'm writing to you these things so that you may not sin, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He himself is the perpetuation for our sins and not only for ours, but also those of the whole world. Just like snatching a stick out of the fire before it's torched, Jesus is there to snatch you out. But you know what? I have a responsibility in this. I have a responsibility. James 4 and verse 7. Submit to God. Resist the devil. And he'll flee from you. You know what that verse says? Here's what it says. Chris, move the truck. Move the truck. Get the truck away. That's what some of you are just dealing with every day of your life. Satan's attacking, attacking, and tapping, and you just keep blowing them off, blowing them off, blowing them off. Move the truck. Submit to God and resist the devil. You tired of the devil chasing you? Move the truck. To God. Pursue righteousness and live right. God rebuked Satan. Point number two this morning. Not only did he rebuke Satan, God removes guilt. You know, there are some times when I stand before God and I just feel dirty. I feel filthy. I feel sinful. I know what I've done. I know those thoughts. I've In those moments, I must humbly come before him and ask for his mercy and his grace and his forgiveness. If you look in verse 3, Joshua is clothed, is now dressed with filthy clothes. These clothes represent Joshua's iniquity. Now, again, not Joshua personally, but the sins of Israel. That's what it's representing there. Israel had sinned, and they're wearing these filthy clothes. And then God says... Take Joshua and put some new clothes on him. Remove the filthy clothes from Joshua and replace them with robes of righteousness. The Holman says splendid robes. See, Joshua was a priest. And he's, he's not clothed 
in priestly garments. He's clothed in these filthy garments. And now God is saying, I'm putting on the clothes of righteousness. Israel has been forgiven and they stand pure, blameless, and guilt free before God. And let me tell you something. If you're a Christian this morning and you've asked Jesus to forgive you of your sins, you stand before him guilt free. Guilt free. That's what he's telling Israel. Take those dirty clothes off and put on the priestly clothes. Look what God says. I have removed your guilt from you. Let me ask you a question. Why are some of you continuing to live in guilt? Guilt. Because some of you continue to struggle with the same sins day after day after day after day. Some of you don't live as though you believe God can remove your guilt. You say, I believe God can forgive my sin, but I don't think God can remove my guilt from my mind. And, it keep, and you keep taking it back and allowing Satan to get the victory. Here's the bottom line. Some of you cannot forgive yourself. Some of you have given up. Here may be the reality. Some of you may not really be a Christian. Hey, God removes the guilt. You need to move the truck. Point number three. God then promises he rewards obedience. Look at back at verse six. If you walk in my ways and you keep my instructions, you will both rule my house and take care of my courts. I will also grant you access among these who are standing here. Obedience is always, I mean, obedience always precedes blessing. Let me say that again. Obedience always precedes blessing blessing. God said, if you will do what I'm telling you to do, walk in my ways and keep my instructions, if you'll do what I'm telling you to do, then I will, then he gives them three things. The first two, rule my house and take care of my courts. What does that mean? This has to do with the worship that will take place when they get the temple rebuilt. He said, if you'll do all these things, then when the temple gets rebuilt, I'll put you in charge of the worship in the temple and what goes on in the outer courts. Then, then Israel, I am going to grant you access. What does that mean? They would have complete access to God's presence. And God said, I'm no longer going to be silent. Let me tell you what, this is Old Testament. We live in the New Testament every single day, as often as I want to or need to. I have personal access to God. I can pray and talk to him and he promises to forgive me of my sin. If you're a Christian today, you have that same access. God gives you access to him. I've told you this before. There are times when, when I tell my administrative assistant, listen, I'm studying in, intensely right now or I'm spending some time in prayer. No interruptions unless their last name is Truett. And they can come in. They can come in. It's usually my youngest wanting to use my bathroom. <laughs> but access. Let's just say it like it is, because your children are the same way. Your children have access to you that I don't have. So do mine. But God gives us complete access. Why? Because I am his child. And if you're a Christian today, God gives you complete access to him. He's telling them, I'll reward you for obedience. I, 
I got some great quotes here from some, some people that I want to share with you about obedience to help you with obedience. Here's the first one. Obedience is an act of faith. Disobedience is a result of unbelief. It takes faith many times to be obedient. Then I love this one from St. Augustine. The cost of obedience is small in comparison to the cost of disobedience. You think back in your life right now, and probably some of you can shake your head about that one. The cost of obedience is small in comparison to the cost of disobedience. Then finally, great moves of God usually follow simple acts of of obedience. Let me just ask you this morning, are you being obedient to God in the little things? In the little things of life, being obedient. This week I was driving back to Kinston and I was listening to a, a, a sermon, a podcast that uh, one of our members sent me and I was listening to Dave Wilson. And Dave Wilson says this, it does no good to try to be like Jesus. I thought, whoa, wait a minute, what did he say? And I turned that thing up again. And he repeated himself. He says, it does no good to try to be like Jesus. So I know there's another statement coming. He said this, we must train to be like Jesus. Some of you are frustrated in your spiritual life because you're just trying and trying and trying and trying. And you know what, honestly, you keep stepping back into ants. You, you blowed them off, you swept them off, you pushed Satan away, but you know what you got to do? You got to what? Move the truck. Quit trying to be like Jesus and train. That means every day, training to be like Jesus involves obedience and God rewards obedience. Last point, God reaffirms forgiveness. You get the, in those last two verses, verses, or last three, eight, nine, and 10. And he talks about there, look at verse eight. Listen, Joshua, the high priest, you and your colleagues sitting before you, indeed, these men are a sign that I am about to bring my servant, the branch. Who is the servant in the branch? That's an Old Testament reference to the coming Messiah, Jesus Christ. That's a reference that he is coming. Now, then he says about this stone. He says, Joshua, I'm going to place a stone as a reminder, and it's going to have seven eyes that are watching you. Now, that's done for a couple different reasons. That stone is a reminder. Throughout the Bible, he is referred to as a rejected stone, a stumbling stone, a stone of refuge, a destroying stone, and a foundation stone. Now he's referred to as one stone with seven eyes. That's referring to the Lord's omniscience. He said, but this stone is twofold. It's going to be watching over you. But then it's a reminder. You know, the older I get, the more I cannot remember. <laughs> I forget everything. So I have to set all kind of reminders of me on my phone. I'll tell you about that last week. Then this week, Kim told me to do something in the house and I had to, had to leave and I was coming back and I said, I'm gonna forget that if I don't do something to remind myself. So I took a stool right up to our table or our, to the bar, countertop bar, and I just put it in the middle of the floor. <clears throat> I said, when I walk back in the house, I'm going to see that stool, and it's going to remind me to do what I was supposed to do. Kim said, what in the world is the stool doing sitting in the middle of the floor? I said, don't you move that stool. She said, what's it there for? I said, it's to remind me. She said, what's it supposed to remind you of? I don't know. I forgot. <laughs> but I did eventually remember. It's a reminder. And, and God is telling Joshua, don't miss this. God said, I'm going to put this stone right here, Joshua. I'm going to put this stone here to remind you of the promises I made. I rebuke Satan on your behalf. I'm removing your guilt. I'm removing your sin. I'm going to remind you of obedience that I'll reward your obedience. And let me tell you right now, again, I'm reminding you and reaffirming that I will forgive your sins. Now, that stone, that stone we're not told what the inscription said. The engraving most likely refers to the cornerstone, probably refers to a cornerstone that would be in that temple that they're going to rebuild. But the stone will have an inscription. The most important thing to understand is that the verse refers to the affirmation that Israel's sins will be 
forgiven. How about you? How about you? Have you had your sins forgiven? See, the problem is, most of you have a problem forgiving yourself. Let's go back to the very beginning. Let's go back to that courtroom scene that I talked about at the very beginning of the sermon. You walk into this courtroom that God is describing. You have the righteous judge, which is God himself. You have the accused. That's me and you. You have the prosecuting attorney at the left. That's Satan telling the court everything you've done wrong. Then you have Jesus, who's the defense lawyer, sitting at the right hand of the Father and reminded he paid for your sins. God, the judge, looks at Satan, the prosecuting attorney, and says, what do you have to say? Satan looks at you and then looks right at God and says, this man is a liar. He's a cheater. He's a thief. He's a drunkard. He's selfish. He has immoral thoughts. Satan comes over to you, pulls off your coat, and then parades you around that courtroom and says, look at him. He's filthy. He's nasty. Look at his clothes. Look at what he's wearing. He's not fit. He's no good. And Satan sits down. God looks to his right and looks to Jesus and says, Jesus, what do you have to say? Jesus looks right at you and looks right back at God and says, one day I heard him cry out and ask me for his forgiveness, for my forgiveness. And he accepted my sacrifice and my death on the cross for his sins. And I do not know about those things anymore. Jesus takes off the rags and then parades you around that courtroom and says, here, look God, I've made him clean. I've made him clean. Then he looks at the crowd and says, what sins are you talking about? And he looks right at Satan. And he says, I don't remember them anymore. And from the book of life, they've all been torn out. I don't remember them anymore. Here's a question for you. What are you remembering in your life that God doesn't remember anymore? You're dealing with guilt. Guilt. What guilt are you carrying? You've been saying for a long time, you may be saying this, God can't forgive me, Chris. God can't forgive me. You know what? To believe that is calling God a liar. God's not a liar. God said he will forgive. But that's not the end of the story. He also says he'll forget. And God, you may be saying, God, okay, I believe you can forgive me, but God, I can't forget myself. And Satan keeps bringing this thing back up in my mind. What is, what is it that he keeps bringing back up? What's he keep bringing back up to you? Hey, let's get real. 
Is it a bad marriage from your past? An abortion when you were younger? A bad relationship with your parents and you're now an adult? And they're gone? An addiction that you had? A failed career that you had great dreams and aspirations for? What is it? If you've gotten forgiven, you know what God says? I don't remember those things. I don't remember those things. Listen, God forgives and God forgets. And he says, I don't remember that junk anymore. Then you stop remembering it. Move forward. How? Fast. But here's what you're going to have to do. Some of you are going to have to move the truck. Will you bow your heads right now? Some of you are dealing with guilt that you just cannot get over. Hey, God wants to forgive you. And let me tell you what else, church. The church should too. To forgive, forget. What are you dealing with right now? Christmas. I, I just, I can't get, I keep, keep thinking about it, keep thinking about it, keep thinking. You know what? That's Satan himself. Say, well, Chris, it was awful. I understand. Sometimes we do awful things. But God stands ready to forgive you right now. Some of you just need to come and drop it at this altar and don't ever pick it back up again. So right now, Chad's going to begin singing right now. Are you dealing with guilt? Would you come right now as Chad begins to sing? If you're dealing with guilt, say, Pastor, I'm just coming. I'm going to put it right here for the last time. Would you stand right now, the whole congregation, would you come right now and give it to God as Chad begins to sing right now? Heads are still bowed, eyes closed. Chad's singing. Would you come and just give it to God right now? I'm tired of the guilt, Pastor. I am tired of living in this. God's forgiven me, but I need to forgive myself right now. Hey, if you stepping out may help someone else step out, would you step out right now and come? Say, God, I'm tired of dealing with this. Because he wants to forgive you and forget it. Where you at right now? Would you come right now? Forget the past. Forget the past. Move the truck and go on with your life. Would you come right now? Chad continues to sing. Think about these words as he's singing them. I come broken. I come broken to be mended. I come wounded to be I come desperate to be rescued. I come empty to be filled. I come guilty to be pardoned by the blood of Christ the Lamb. And I'm welcome with open arms. Praise God. Just as I am. Now, let me tell you what's happening right now. In a crowd this big, I know there's people dealing with guilt. I know because I've dealt with guilt before. And you're dealing with it. Here's what you're saying right now. I'll just keep blowing Satan off. I'll just keep blowing the sidewalk off. I'll just keep blowing it. I'll keep blowing it. 
And you know what? Those ants are going to keep coming back every single time. Some of you need to do right now what I've told you to do. You need to move the truck and you need to come give this thing to God for the last time and don't pick it back up. Chad, just a chorus. It's the last chorus we'll sing. Do you need to come right now? Come broken. Let God heal you. Let God get you over that so you can forget it. You come right now. Some have come right now. How about you? You need to come right now. You need to forget something. Chad's just going to go right back into that chorus again. Right now, you come and deal with it right now. Come broken. God wants to heal you right now. Sing it with us. Come broken to be mended. I come wounded. You need to come right now. Half a chorus left. Maybe you've never been forgiven of your sins. Jesus wants to forgive you of your sins right now. We'd love to pray with you about that right now. You need to come and make that prayer. You need to ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins for the very first time. heads bowed. We're not going to sing anymore. <clears throat> Here's my question for you. <clears throat> First of all, do you know for sure that you're a Christian? Do you know for sure there's been a time in your life when you prayed and asked God to forgive you of your sins and that you know for sure that you're a Christian? If you're unsure about that, I won't embarrass you. I'm not going to point you out. I'm not going to come to you. But if you're unsure about that, would you just raise your hand right now? I'd love to pray for you. Just slip your hand up right now. Just really quick. Just long enough for me to see it. I'm looking over on the piano side. Anybody over in these two sections, right in front of the sound booth? Anybody? You don't know for sure that you're saved. How about in the two center, center sections or in the balcony? You don't know for sure that you're saved. Just slip your hand up real quick. I will not embarrass you. I promise anyone now on the far my left side on the drum side is what we call this if you're unsure that you're saved just slip your hand up real quick so I can pray for you <clears throat> anybody don't leave here today unforgiven and don't leave here today carrying your guilt back home with you. God said, I forgive you and I forget it. You do the same. And let me just tell you a quick fact. If it comes back up in your mind, it's Satan bringing that up, not God. Father, we just pray right now that you would seal this message in our hearts. And Lord, that we would think about it throughout the day. And then that we would leave our forgiven sins alone because you remember them no more. Thank you for the truth of that lesson this morning like snatching a stick out of the fire well, thank you for doing that for me in Jesus name I pray amen I want to thank you for being here I want to remind you men to uh, sign up now for next Saturday open to all men cookout 5 o'clock over in the Paramore building We'll have steaks. I didn't hear many ladies clapping for those steaks, but I uh, hope that you'll sign up. Be a part of a life group. We'll see you Wednesday night. May God bless you.